Today's episode is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at www.anxietydiariespodcast.com forward slash audible. Hello and welcome to Anxiety Diaries, a weekly podcast about mental health, incredible people, and so much more. I'm your host, Scott Newmeyer, and this is episode 19. If you like what you hear, please make sure you subscribe. And if you get a chance, head over to Apple Podcasts to rate and review the show. It really does help us, and we really do appreciate it. Today on the show, we have Jonathan Santlofer. He's a writer and artist, and his debut novel, The Death Artist, was an international bestseller translated into 17 languages and is currently in development for screen adaptation. His fourth novel, Anatomy of Fear, won the Nero Award for the best novel of 2009. His short stories have appeared in numerous anthologies, and he is the author of the recently published It Occurs to Me That I Am America. His paintings and drawings are included in collections at Metropolitan Museum of Art, Newark Museum, Art Institute of Chicago, and more. He's the recipient of two National Endowment for the Arts grants and serves on the board of Yaddo, the oldest arts community in the United States. His new book, In Stores Now, is The Widower's Notebook, a memoir about grief and grieving and love and so many other things. It's a really, really powerful book. We're going to talk about grief and some of the ramifications that grief can bring into your life. Other things that can manifest like anxiety, addiction. I honestly believe that The Widower's Notebook is one of the best grief memoirs that I've ever read. It's right up there with work from people like Joan Didion, an incredibly gracious person. Jonathan has a lot to say, and I hope you'll enjoy it. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And without further ado, here's Jonathan. Welcome to the podcast, Jonathan. Thank you so much for being here. It's great to be here, Scott. Thanks so much. I've been looking forward to this talk since I first read this book months ago. It just shook me to the core. Uh, you probably saw my tweet. I did. I saw, you know, it's interesting when I come upon these tweets or posts and people say that because, you know, we all live in a kind of bubble despite the explosion of social media. And so you never really know how your work affects other people and when and to read something like that is extraordinary i do say to people when they say you know like sort of somebody wrote recently you know it tore my heart apart but mended it back up and i said well i'm really glad for that second part you know right. i don't intentionally want to break anybody's heart but thank you for that I, I i really appreciated that post very much it's a fantastic book it's in stores now and you've gotten some incredible reviews you've got some awesome blurbs how has it felt to finally get this out into the world i'll be perfectly honest with you you know it, it's one of those things you know to write a memoir that deals with loss and the greatest loss in my life is filled with a with complex emotions you know on the one hand of course i want it to do well and i want it to be read by as many people as possible but it's it's also a little bit difficult to think about that because for a very personal book though I guess, you know, when you're writing a book like this, when you finally commit to doing it, for me, I realized, God, I, I have to make this the best book I've ever written. And that means, you know, editing it and transcribing things and making choices. So, you know, I, I've been very, I felt very fortunate and very uh, pleased with the way people are reacting to the book. I've been getting just tons and tons of messages from people, you know, saying that the book moved them and that just when they were getting teary, they would laugh and that makes me <laughs> makes yeah. me happy too you know um I, I didn't set out to write a sad book i don't know what i i think i just you know i started writing a chronicle of my time and it just turned into this other th thing in many ways so i mean it's a grief memoir in, in the tradition of grief memoirs it's rightfully getting compared to joan didion and books like that but there aren't a lot of these from the male perspective was that one of the reasons you kind of wanted to write this not only to deal with your own pain but kind of to tell other men it's okay to feel this way uh you probably just put that better than i could put it interestingly when i was starting to transcribe my notebooks and this is before i really thought this would be a book i left 
let a few people read it, uh, one of them being Joyce Carol Oates, the writer. And she said to me, and I, this is a direct quote, she said, you have to keep writing this because men don't write these kind of books. Yeah. And it was a very encouraging message to me. You know, for me, I couldn't read or do much for a year after my my wife's death was very sudden, very unexpected, really horrifying. And I couldn't read or do anything. But when I started reading, what I read were grief memoirs by really good writers. Um, and they were helpful to me. You know, they made me feel less alone and part of this greater thing that we call humanity. So I guess that was important to me. But I also did feel, and people have been saying this, which is really making me happy, that to have the male perspective, it's not that it's all that different, but that it's a voice we haven't heard so much. And anytime somebody compares me to Joan Didion, which has now been several times, <laughs> you know, I get <laughs> chills. Joan Didion is one of my one of our greatest writers, one of my favorite writers. Uh, I'll just tell you that I, I had read The Year of Magical Thinking long before my wife died, when, when the book came out. And I thought it was a beautiful book. But when I read it after my wife died, it resonated with me in a totally different way. You know, in that book, she refers to herself as a cool customer because that's the way the hospital talked about her. The night John Gregory Dunn, her husband, died, and I thought, you know, that's the mask that I kind of wear in the world as a cool customer. And, and so I, I very much related to that book. I hope that my book will give men permission to grieve as they want to grieve, openly or not. But I would say I hope it gives everyone that permission. And, you know, we have a culture that doesn't really, that has a shelf life for grief and a whole bunch of things. And um, nobody's sure what to say or how to how to deal with it. And so I just, I tried to be as honest as I possibly could. You know, that's all I can say really about that. But I'm glad if it just makes a couple of men feel, a man came up to me last night after this reading at the 92nd Street Y and said, I started I started reading your book the other day and, and my wife died a year ago and I had not been able to talk about it. And reading just a third of your book has made me be able to speak to my sons about it. And that made me feel we both got a little teary in front of a crowd of a couple of hundred people. But it was really a, a wonderful moment for me, too. That's the magic in this, right? The magic in the yeah, words. Yeah, 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 absolutely. There is so much pain and hope and real openness in the book. There's so much about grief and grieving and trying to live again and move on, but there's so much else in here too. For instance, can you talk a little bit about how art, both the act of writing this book and also your actual literal artwork and just creating art helped you deal with the grief and the pain and the anxiety and things like that? I think naturally being a writer, it was a place to put my thoughts and my feelings and my emotions. You know, as I said, I just started for myself. I had never journaled or kept a diary or anything like that. But I think when people are going through particularly the immediacy and aftermath of trauma and grief, writing things down for yourself is very helpful. Uh, it was for me. It made It helped me make sense of you know, everything felt very chaotic and I felt very outside of myself. And so I would come home and just write these things in, in my journals, uh, which ultimately became the Widower's Notebook. You know, it was just helpful for me. It was good for me. In terms of the drawings, the actual artwork, I went to art school and I, I spent the first half of my adult life as a painter. So drawing is something I love, comes fairly naturally to me. And I, d I did what maybe seems like a weird thing, but I couldn't have photographs in my home. I, you know, I, it was too hard for me to come across a photograph of my wife and myself or, or with our daughter. It would just shatter me, you know, so I, I took them all and I hid them. And then I found one night that what I could do was I could make drawings and sketches of my wife or, or the three of us and that it kept me close to my wife and to the moment, but it was also kind of this little bit of escape at the same time. It's hard to explain, but, you know, it's sort of drawing makes you coordinate your mind and hand. So you have to concentrate, but it leaves a part of your mind open. So I could think about 
what I was drawing while I was concentrating on, you know, making the marks and making it into something. And, you know, I, 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 I've said to people, I think any kind of work, you know, it doesn't have to be artwork at all, for sure. You know, if you love gardening, if you're a cook, learn more about it, do more of it, because I think, and I really have seen this, that if you do that, it really helps you. I'm not going to say get past it because I'm not sure you get past or let's say get over these things. They're part of you forever, but it does help you move forward. It does help you. So it was a great help to me. And, you know, I must have done 80 sketches during a two year period after my wife's death and, and the publisher of Penguin uh, liked them so much that, you know, she just cho chose her 12 favorites to put in the actual book. And I let her choose whatever she wanted. It was fine with me. I didn't say, oh, what about this one? What about this one? She chose what she liked. And that was that was fine with me. I love how you've been releasing more of them on Twitter, though. Yeah, <laughs> it's almost like yeah. a bonus content for the book. A really good friend of mine who had seen a whole batch of the drawings or many of the drawings said, oh, you should just release these as a book. And I said, you know, I, I really don't want to do that. It doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel like something I want to do. And then he said, well, why not just post them so people can look at them? And so I started doing that. And I was amazed at how much reaction they've been getting. People seem to really like them. And I don't know if it's the nature of the drawing or if people love pictures or if they touch people in a certain way. I'm going to keep doing it because it's sort of uh, keeps something going for me or keeps an attachment going for me that is helpful and makes me feel more attached to people. So I like that. It's like keeping the candle burning. I mean, there's something really emotional about seeing something that you did and labored over in such an emotional mm -hmm. way. It, it's a beautiful thing. And I, I, I could see why it connects with people. Thank you so much. You know, we all do these things in our lives where, uh, I don't know, for this thing, you know, I was doing it for myself. Yeah. And I had no idea that I would ever be presenting it to the world. And that becomes kind of an interesting and odd thing that something you think you're doing for yourself has resonance with other people in the world yeah. is a surprise. You know, it's, it's a real surprise and, and a very good one. So, yeah, I'm going to keep releasing them. There are some I won't release <laughs> sure. because i think they're bad drawings you know? <laughs> i was doing them at four in the morning and my pencils were breaking and i thought ah and some of them were crumpled because i would get upset yeah. so I don't, I don't although this this one friend of mine says you know i love the one that you've ripped in half you should really <laughs> i think no i ripped it in half because i was in pain i think i'm gonna leave that one yeah that's the kind of stuff that does resonate with people, though. I mean, seeing something crumpled up because you think that it, it, it you didn't do a good job on it, or your grief or your pain or your anxiety was too high at the moment when you did it, that does yeah. connect to people. They they feel that. I wonder if I, well, you're making me now think <laughs> that I should release it, Scott. I, I, I don't, you know, I'll think about it. I, I will think about it. I yeah, mean, I mean, it's a personal one, decision. There's one in particular that I remember I was drawing, and I, I sort of lost contact with the drawing somehow and got caught up in the emotion, and I just crumpled the drawing up. I didn't throw it away. Yeah. Uh, I didn't throw any of them away, but yeah, maybe that, maybe people, I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. I'll, I have to work myself up to that. Yeah, there's something about the process, the art, artistic process that people find, you know, fascinating. You know, the artistic process is a, an interesting thing because, and I, and I wrote about this, I write about the drawing in the book, and, and one of the things is that people think that, you know, they think of artists, visual artists, as these kind of madmen, mad women, you know, sure. painting and out of control and drinking and doing all this stuff in their studio. There are plenty of them, and there has been history of them, but really to make decent art, it's very controlled. You know, you have to somehow figure out how to sort of pull in your own emotional state and put it into the work yeah. so that other people can have that emotion. I remember my graduate school painting teacher said, take all of your emotions, good and bad, and put them in your work. You know, don't go crazy. Put them in your work. And I thought that was, I have that quote on my wall. <laughs> I love it. You know, so so the days that I feel crazy, you know. Yeah, sure. We all have. <laughs> yeah. <them. laughs> yeah. 
So on the other side of this, though, you talk a lot about using your laptop, viewing Netflix entertainment as, as a way to finally push some of the thoughts out of your head. You know, you're up on yeah. watching Netflix. It seems like Netflix worked more like an escape for you rather than a solve or a bomb. What did having that outlet mean for you at that time? Well, you know, I think it worked both ways. It was escapist. And I, I know I wrote this line because it came to me at one point. I could be alone in my bed with my laptop and watching a series or watching something. And I wouldn't feel totally alone. You know, I had this cast of characters with me in the room. So that was a kind of salve or bomb as well as something to escape into. You know, you, you know, one of the great things about art and certainly movies and television and books is that if they work, you do escape into them and you forget yourself. Yeah. You know, it's something that we forget and we think it's purely entertainment. And, and yeah, of course it's entertainment, you know, and, and in some ways, all artists and filmmakers, dancers, you know, we're entertainers but but there's this other thing that is real or equally real which is that artists invite you into their world and if that world is believable you just go into it you know and it takes you away from you know i find i'll get my laptop addiction was pretty bad during my grieving period but i still do it to a certain degree that's for sure and i find that particularly something that will take me into a literal a literal other world like i just finished babylon berlin lots of it doesn't make sense but it doesn't matter because you're in 1929 berlin when things didn't make sense right. and just the beauty of this thing and the sort of perversity of it and the characters are so rich i look forward to it you know i think like god i can't wait to get back to that and it's also very fanciful like things change that are, that are very unexpected or there are dream sequences and so i think that I do believe, and I I think this is true, and and probably for myself, why I make it, you know, why I wanted to be an artist is, um, you know, I wasn't really, oh God, I wasn't really good at much else, I didn't think. You know, I was a bad student. I was, you know, one of those boys who would have been certainly medicated because I was very ADHD. And the thing I could do was draw, you know, and and it kind of saved my life, I feel. So I continued to do that. And I, you know, making it, literally making a painting or making a drawing is such an experience that's it's a, such a full experience that you that you escape into that is also a bomb, but it's not totally dislocated somehow. Yeah. There's still a part, you know, and so I find that and I find it with writing. Writing is very encompassing because you can't think of anything else to, because you're, you know, there are words in your head, but you are escaping into the world you're creating with words. Thinking of my, my memoir, The Widower's Notebook, as I talked to you, this just came to me. And one of the things that really did for me was allow me to put into words and create the world I was experiencing and put it down on paper for other people people and and you you probably noticed i go back and forth in time you know i go back to when my wife and i first met and to lots of wonderful memories and and what that would do of course is bring those memories alive for me so it was a great when i say it was a great experience for me that's a really double-edged sword because believe me i didn't want to write it but the act of writing it was a really good, healthy thing for me to do. And I feel lucky that I had a place that I could do that. Yeah, I mean, you literally pretty much say it in the book. That you say, because it's what I always try to do, make things okay, even when I can't. And then, yeah, and then you even yeah. go on and you say, it was as if I had stumbled into a black room and was trying to find my way out without a guide and with only half of my senses. This book feels like you getting your way out. Well, I'm glad to hear you say that. And I I appreciate that. I definitely did feel that way. You know, um, there's the dislocation of sudden loss and grief is very hard to explain because it's changing sort of moment by moment. And, and it's... Uh, things feel very unreal. I, I would say that's the word that comes to me. It feels very unreal. And what starts to happen, a woman came up to me last night at the Y afterward and said her husband had died eight years ago and she didn't yet feel better about it. And I asked her, well, what are you doing to make yourself feel better? And she said, nothing. 
And I said, that's your work. Yeah. That's what you've got to do. You have just find What do you love to do? What is something you want to learn? Do you want to learn a language? Do you, just do something. I said to her, I promise you, you will start to feel better. And, and I don't listen. I'm not I didn't write a how to book. I don't like how to books. I'm not an expert in anything. I, I can only relate what things felt like for me. And, you know, I've talked to a lot of, obviously, to a lot of people who have suffered loss or trauma. And I think there is a pretty fairly general agreement that doing something is a lot better than doing nothing. I yeah. think you know that, Scott, right? For sure. I mean, it works the same way with mental illness, mental health. Right. You got to find your passion, right? Follow right. your bliss. Right. And right. that's how you get through things, you know, that yeah. plus time. I saw that you had Amanda Stern on yeah. just recently, and I know Amanda. She's just a wonderful person. Fantastic. And that was, yeah, and that was such a, her book is great, Little Panic. That's and amazing. And I, I, I thought your conversation with her was really good because so many people experience, you know, the isolation of anxiety or panic, and they think it's just them, yeah. you know? I went to Amanda's first book reading here in New York, and she talked about how, you know, the phone rings and she feels instant anxiety about picking it up. And I thought, so do I. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, because somehow there's part of our personality, at least somebody like me and, or like Amanda, that somehow expects bad news, yeah. you know? What's great about her book or books like this is that thing of making other people realize, no, you're not the only one who suffers this. There's lots of us, you know? And that's one of the reasons I started this podcast, really, you know, was to talk to people about these types of things so that people would realize that they're not alone. There are so many yeah. other people out there. The grief you describe in this book manifests in so many other ways as well. You know, anxiety, pain, addiction for instance, mm -hmm. you know, all yeah, these things yeah. manifest out of what you're dealing with. Yeah, it's a weird thing because, you know, when you list those things, I think when you're under, in the midst of extreme grief or loss, all of these things are magnified. I said last night at this talk, and it, it just came to me that Joyce Carol Oates is talking about a part in her book, which she calls something like cruel, crude, and well-intentioned. The thing, the weird things people said to her. And I have a section of my book called <laughs> Stupid Things Said by Smart People, <laughs> <Right>. you know, <laughs> where people said things to me like I thought, oh my God, what? Yeah. You know, but, but I said last night that, you know, you're in such a raw state when when you're going through this that I almost want to take that out of my book, even though people seem to like it because it's it's funny. In it's a, human. In a, it, yeah, and it is human. And none of us know what to say. And I think that that is true for many deeply feeling people. Things affect them really strongly. I mean, I, in my normal life, things do. And during this period, it was just magnified. And my, yeah, the pills and all that. Yeah, that's in the book. Do you still feel that pull of that addiction ever? Because there's all these mysteries solved throughout. But that mystery was still there for me. <laughs> well, the first thing, you know, I, I couldn't sleep at all. Yeah. And I, I guess I should explain that my wife's death was so sudden. My wife died in, in a matter of probably 10 minutes in my arms unexpectedly. It was shattering. And if you'd been talking to me three years ago, I, I couldn't have even just said what, I, what I've said to you. I can now verbalize it and say it. But because of that, when I went to see my regular doctor, who I've been seeing for years, he said, and I said to him, I can't sleep. I can't close my eyes without seeing everything that happened again. He said, well, you're suffering from, you know, some form of post-traumatic stress disorder. Yeah. And he gave me Ambien. Now, no offense to Ambien, but it yeah. was not it was not good for me. It just was not at all good for me. And then he gave me lorazepam which was too good for me. <laughs> right. <laughs> I loved it, you know, and right. um, it, it took, you know, it just sort of softened the edge, I, edge for me uh, when I'd get into bed. And I think 
I yeah, I have a scene in my book where I can't find my lorazepam, and I almost have a meltdown. You know, I'm ready to go out on the streets and try and score. You know, drugs. I am not at that stage anymore. I still do on occasion when I'm particularly anxious or sad. I still will, you know, break off a piece of sure. lorazepam and take it. Yeah, but I don't. I don't take them during the day because, well, for two reasons. One, because I want to make sure they'll still have some efficacy for sleeping purposes and two because i think they make me ever so slightly fuzzy and dopey yeah so i'm I'm a little bit afraid of taking them during the day and then i'm not gonna make sense so i certainly don't feel addicted to those drugs anymore but i'm not against them you know i'm not and i'm not against people taking antidepressants or anything like you know these are chemical conditions too and, yeah. and one has to one has to deal with them as best they can so i love to hear the fact that you're able to use this in a manageable good way because that's one of the things that i try to do on this podcast as well is destigmatize that you know there's so many people out there who will say it's not good to take medication and that's one of the things that gets us through things sometimes absolutely you know it's funny uh, I'll tell you, my doctor, Dan Silvershine, who I, I'm really fond of, and I've been going him for a long time, and, and he said to me, because I, I expressed my sort of apprehension a bit about taking drugs at sure. the time, and he said, you know, the anxiety and depression and sadness you're going through will do worse harm to your body than these drugs will do. He said, I don't want you taking them forever because it's not great for you. But for now, this is something you need and it's okay. Yeah. Give yourself permission to do that. I don't know if you've ever, you probably have though, read Andrew Solomon's book, The Noonday Demon. Sure. And his struggles with depression. You know, he's a great, great writer. And I think his book, Far From the Tree, is one of the most important books of the decade. But The Noonday Demon talks about his struggle with depression and how drugs helped him. And this is a man who is incredibly productive and brilliant. And I say, thank God there were drugs to help him, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. Sometimes you need that. And, you know, and then there's the other side of the coin too. someone like Leslie Jameson's new book, The Recovering, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. is an incredible book that can show both the horrors and the delights of right. you know, alcoholism and addiction and all these other things. But it's one of those things you never would have known. Like you just don't know what someone's going through. Anthony Bourdain's death, I think, affected people in that way because And we, uh, last night I happened to be after this talk. I was out with Joyce Carol Oates and with Dan Halpern, who was Anthony Bourdain's editor and friend. And we were talking about why his particular death and suicide affected so many people. And, you know, the fact that we look at somebody like Anthony Bourdain from the exterior and all we see is this great personality, handsome, tremendously successful guy. Mm -hmm. And we think if he can't make it, I mean, how can we possibly make it? You know, so that kind of thing hits us so strongly. But I think it says so much about the way we as you just exactly put it, the way we see other people, you know, we don't, this is another little segue here, but the way we look at social media, you know, social media always strikes me as people for the most part are telling the best things in their life, you know? So it kind of adds to what I call our culture of desire. You know, you look at it, you think, Oh my God, I I haven't done anything. Look at this person. You know, they published 18 books in the last four days. (laughs) And, you know, and this, you know, it's, it's like, uh, but, you know, it's somebody was recently kind of bad mouthing a friend of mine who, who will go nameless, but who is having a tremendous amount of success. And I got really annoyed. And not just because this person is my friend, but I said, you have no idea what this person's going through, you know, and, and who has worked very hard for this and who is just a regular person. You can't judge that. So, you know, I think it's a kind of controlling our jealousies and and trying to understand that beyond the glitz and the glamour we may see of other people there's there's still people you know there's still regular people who suffer and i think that's a really important thing to remember i think it's helpful to us for us to remember that and i think that's why books like yours are so important because they remind us of that i appreciate that i hope that's true it gives people something to relate to and to understand that they're not so alone in the world that's what i hope for you know and and to see a 
kind of life that has its ups and downs and all the regular stuff that most of us go through and how we manage to cope with them and when they go wrong. And, you know, not everything is solvable. We know that. Certainly death, you know, that kind of loss is nothing we can do about it. Uh, yeah. except except try to get through it best we can. You know, I, I, I have this quote in the book. I, I read, it was this essay that Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote after his son died, and it's a really painful, painful essay. And he, he sort of ends it by saying that grief has taught me nothing. And, you know, it struck me that he probably wrote that essay too soon, not that I'm sure he, he never got over the loss of his son. And I, I think there are many things we never get over that we shouldn't get over. But I do think that grief can teach you things. I think it can teach you to, to open up, to, you know, confront your denial, to be more understanding of other people's grief. So I, I do think it, it maybe I am an optimistic person in some ways, but I, I, I think, you know, I have my dark side. But I do believe that. Some of the worst things can, you know, once we survive them and get through them, can help us manage with the rest of our lives, yeah. the other things in our life. And I, I think you'd agree with that. I right? totally, I mean, it helps you grow. Right towards the end of the book, you say, I'm no longer a man who cannot cry. I'm a man who cannot stop crying. I know, it's kind of sad. That's, you know what, though? That's growth. That's what, that's what comes from it. I know. You know, I, I, uh, I think I suffered from all of the worst stereotypes of being a man in our culture, yeah. you know, sort of closed up, never cry, think I can control everything, all of that. And then suddenly here comes this thing, you know, where I could not save my wife. I cannot control wh what I'm doing. I can't sleep. I can't think I can't work. It really showed me something. And, and, you know, last night, I said to, to Joyce just before our event, I said, my goal, she said, is there anything you don't want me to ask you? And I said, well, I don't think so. But my goal for tonight is not to cry in front <laughs> of 200 people. And I, I didn't. I got a, every once in a while, I got a little choked up. But mainly, you know, we were both in, I think, our, our best sort of funny form, too, yeah. which was which was good. Uh but I'm not I'm not sorry about that. You know, I used to save my crying for, you know, animals being killed or hurt in yeah. movies and things. And I believe me, that still kills me. But I'm much more open to my feelings in a way that I just never was before. And if that's what came out of this, then that's not such a bad thing to realize, you know, that I'm as vulnerable as, as everyone else, you know, that we all are. Absolutely. This is, this is obviously the most personal thing you've written. You've written a lot of things, you've created so much art, but is this also the project you're most proud of? Oh boy, that's a great question. Proud is possibly a difficult word for me to use in relation to this. I would say, uh, let me repeat, that it's a book I hoped or never expected to be writing. But once I committed to writing it, you know, it's funny, I channeled my wife and I thought she would say to me, well, you better make this your best book. And that's for sure. And I do think it is probably my best book. Am I proud of it? I guess what I would say in a kind of double edged way is that I'm proud I was able to do it. And I was proud to, you know, to, to finish it and get it out there in the world. Somebody asked me the other day, you know, well, what's the difference? They asked me a very obvious question, you know, what's the difference between fiction and writing a memoir? And I said, well, the obvious thing is you're not making it up. You know, when you're writing a novel, it's fun. It's a little bit torture, but it's fun because you're making it up, you know, and you're following this adventure and this story. And that's great. When you're writing a memoir, you are drawing upon truth and what you've experienced I think Joyce said it last night in our conversation that you have to make a lot of choices, though, because you have so much truth. You know, I had five filled notebooks of things that I had written. And, you know, a lot of them, mean, I don't think would mean anything to anyone but me. And so uh, they're not in the book. It's still work to put it together. Otherwise, it's just minutia. Exactly. Yeah. And, and you know, I'll tell you something, Scott. I believe... This sounds really highfalutin, but it's not. I believe in art. And what I, what I mean by that is that you have to take whatever it is you're doing, if it's a scribble or if it's words, 
and you have to shape it into something. Yeah. You know, you have to make it something that will be able to be read or seen and understood and felt by other people. Otherwise, there's no real point in letting it go out there. So I am now you're bringing me back to proud. I am proud that I was able to do that, you know, that I was able to shape this book. I mean, there were moments when I, I think I say this in the book that I, I couldn't believe I'm editing and thinking about the sentences in a book this personal, you know, but I did. I had to. I had to, you know, I mean, uh, why would anyone else want to read it then? You know, and, and people are telling me that which is kind of funny in a way. But the thing that keeps coming up and it was one of the first questions last night, which was. This book reads like a, you know, it's like a thriller. It's like a page turner. Yeah. And they said, you know, did you do that intentionally? And I said, well, you know, no, but I published six crime novels. Right. And, that's what you and do. maybe it's part of my DNA yeah. that that's the way I know how to tell a story. But I'm glad for that. You know, I, I was in a bookstore and the bookstore owner was talking to me about a memoir by a well-known writer. And she asked if I had read it, which I hadn't. And she, you know, nameless, but she said, oh, don't. She said, there's no engine in it. You know, you have no reason to keep reading. And, you know, it's odd, but I, you know, I teach writing and I, I tell my students, you've got to keep, you have to have an engine in your work yeah. you know, in your, you know, people have to have something to keep reading for. Now, did I think about that consciously? I don't think I did. And yet I must have, I must have done it because I think it's, it's there, you know, and I can see it now and people point it out to me. And I'm glad, you know, I, I, you know, the worst thing you can have is do something that people put down after five pages, right? It works very similar to the way that the Aton Pate stuff does in Amanda's book. Yes, that's true. Yeah, she uses that. When I say uses that, I, I mean that in the best way, uh, you know, as a as a light motif in the book that keeps you turning pages. And I think that was probably very conscious on her part. You know, it, it was something that meant something a lot to her. You know, Amanda's a, a complex person. She's I'm sure you know this from talking to her, but, you know, she's she's a big personality. She's funny. She's really kind. And yet she's filled with all of this, as she admits freely, anxiety and panic. And it's something she doesn't allow people to see. So I think her book's very brave in that way. We've talked about the fact that I'm kind of one of those people who would rather be, you know, joking and funny than be serious. And, you know, it's my way of dealing with things. And there are funny things in my book, but, but I also know that my book is a serious book. And I didn't shy away from that. You know, um, I, I let it unfold in the way that I thought that it would be, you know, it was the best way to let it unfold. I think Joy would be proud of this book. Oh, thank you so much. That, now you know you're going to get me crying <laughs> on, you know, Listen, on air. <laughs> if, if Joyce Carol Oates couldn't do it, I'm not going to try. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I hope my wife would be proud of it. I I, um, I think she would. Yeah. Oh, thank you. It's, it's, it's a, you know, it's a hard one with my daughter and myself. We talk about that, you know, doing something like this is, is, is tough, but I felt compelled, you know, the book sort of wrote itself. Think about the good it's doing now. I hope so. I really do hope that, you know, that, that would be whenever anybody asks me, what do you hope for your book? I, that's what I say that it does. It helps somebody else, yeah. you know, and, and that, you know, that, that to me is, a wonderful thing. It's a great thing. I do hope that. What do you do to take care of yourself daily? You know, you're dealing with everything that you that you talked about in this book. You're still dealing with, I'm sure, in ways and all these other anxieties that are going on. How do you take care of yourself on a daily basis? Wow. You know, if my daughter were here, she would say he doesn't take care of himself <laughs> at all. So, you know, the other day she was talking to me and she said, Daddy, do me a favor. Go sit in a chair and breathe for a while. Yeah. Of course, what happens to me is I try and meditate, and I'm good at meditating and breathing when things are fine and not anxious and not crazy. And when they are, I'm not so good at it. But I did yesterday, you know, I, I knew I had this big event, and I did sit down, and I was very conscious about my breathing and trying not to think about anything but my breathing. I also, I do a variety of things. I mean, one of the things I do, and one of the reasons that I, I'm still in this noisy, dirty, crazy place called New York is that it's a great walking city. And so I make it a point, no matter what I'm doing, if I've been writing for a few hours or drawing, that I go out 
and I take walks. And my minimum is two miles a day, which is, by the way, very easy, very easy if you can walk. If you if you have other problems with that, then you find other ways. So I'll just do my errand. I'll walk to the post office, which is not that close, and then I'll walk downtown, and then I'll walk over there. And, and those, I find that that's very, despite the noise and the taxi cabs that are trying to run me down and the horns and it doesn't necessarily relax me but it takes me out of what i've been thinking about you know and i think that that is very important beyond that i i would say that my work has become very important to as a kind of healthy exercise you know when i find it's not being healthy when i realize for example i've been sitting for way too long in one spot writing i get up and i do something else but i think for the most part doing my work is good for me i am one of those people who loves to do work and do things so um i'm not somebody who likes to sit around so that is helpful to me as well a couple of my friends are trying to get me to do yoga i've done a few classes yeah i think they're gonna have to hit me with a stun gun to do that <laughs> you know <laughs> i'm just I have it's not your much, thing it's not for much, everybody what about you? What, do you what do you do i know the things i need to do uh, uh-huh. i need to get better at exercise eating healthier moving yeah. around and stuff like that but breathing is the is the main thing for me man um you know just taking a few minutes to breathe in, in a very measured way that's yeah. what works for me well that's know? what i've been doing i've been doing that and you know what's crazy about that is you can do that for 10 minutes yeah and you feel the results oh for sure and yeah. yet and yet to get yourself to sit down and do that for 10 minutes why is it so hard <laughs> I know. you know i know because you, uh, you know I'm, what though, I'm very bad with guilt. I always feel like I should be doing something else. Ah, uh, you know, yeah. something quote unquote more productive. Oh yeah, I know about that one. I know about that one. But you know, one of the things maybe we need to say to ourselves is, if I don't take these ten, fifteen minutes to breathe and relax, I'm not going to be able to do that other stuff, or I'm not going to be able to do it well. I agree. That's the approach to take. Yeah, you, know, you have to be able to fill your cup. Yeah, absolutely. Yep, yeah, because it'll run dry and that that's not so good yep so where can the people find you online well i have a difficult name which is unfortunate but it's jonathan spelled in the normal way j-o-n-a-t-h-a-n i call that the normal way so the people who spell it with an o at the end just got annoyed yeah. <laughs> uh, my last name is really difficult santlofer it's s like sam a-n-t-l-o-f E R Jonathan Santlofer.com. But if you just put my name in, you can go to my website. There's a lot of stuff there. Or you could probably Google me. And somebody told me they if you write in the widower's notebook, it'll pop up because it's getting a lot of attention. And then from there you could probably go to my website and see some drawings and You're all over the social medias. Uh well, I don't know if I'm all over the media. That would <laughs> That would be a little much for everyone, but uh, enough, you know, and, and, and I hope people will read the book and, and, you know, that's a crazy word to use, but I hope they'll enjoy it. And what I mean by that is take something, take something away from it. You know, I think they will. I certainly have. And I think that people that listen to this podcast especially will, because it works on so many different levels, you know, like I said, grief manifests in so many other ways as well. Yeah. Everybody knows somebody who's lost someone everybody yeah indeed and you know i hate to say it because i don't want to depress people but you know we're all going to lose someone yeah um and it is no fun it is no fun but we have to learn to talk about it and to figure out strategies and ways to you know i had some friends who disappeared but i had many friends who were amazing yeah for me you know and that's we do just, we have to talk about it. I think it's, you know, we don't want to spend our lives talking about it because then we'll be paralyzed with it. But it is a real thing and we can't hide it is what I'm saying. You know, that's all. We, we can't hide it. And, and, and I hope people will relate to that and come away not feeling sad, but feeling like, oh, okay, this guy did it. You know, yeah. he doesn't seem that special. I can do it too, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So. Well, I think it, it works on that level. I think it works on several levels. It's a great book. It's in stores now and you can find it anywhere books are sold. Thank you so much, Scott. I no, really thank appreciate you. that. It's great talking to you. 
call us, leave us a message at 732-903-4441 or drop us an email at anxietydiariespodcast at gmail.com. You can find the podcast at www.anxietydiariespodcast.com where you can sign up for our newsletter as well. And you can find us on Instagram and Facebook at Anxiety Diaries Podcast. We're also on Twitter at Anxiety Diary Pod. Thanks again for listening. Be well, and we'll see you next week. Oh,